everybody. We've almost got seven o'clock here, so I figured I would just start with uh, some of the uh, background information. Um, so my name is Amanda and I'm the coordinator for the Manitoba Important Bird Areas program. And uh, welcome to our second last uh, webinar in our uh, spring webinar series. Um, a couple of housekeeping comments. This webinar is being recorded. Um, if everyone in the webinar today could have their microphones muted during the presentation, that would be much appreciated. Um, if you have a comment that you're worried you will forget, please type it into the chat. Um, you can find the chat as the little um, speech bubble. Um, I think it's probably going to be on the right-hand corner of your screen. Um, also, if you'd like to ask a question during our question periods, you are also welcome to unmute yourself through the microphone button. Um, I think it will be gray for you while you're muted and when you click it, it should turn green and then I can hear you. Uh, questions are being recorded, so if we do not get to all of the questions during our time today, I can get answers back to you via email. So um, I'll start off with a brief history of uh, our prairie habitat in Manitoba. And you may hear me use the words prairie and grasslands interchangeably. And when I use both, I'm talking about our native habitat. Um, although, uh, or, and if I'm, I'm talking about um, tame grassland, I'll say that too. So grasslands in Manitoba were historically maintained um, through disturbance both by grazing um, with the large uh, herbivores on the land, like bison, as well as with fire cycles. Um, the disturbance prevented encroachment by woody plants that would otherwise change the habitat away from prairie. Uh, additionally, bison also provided large and concentrated inputs of nutrients in a mosaic pattern across the landscape. So when you've got a big herd of bison going through, not only are they grazing on any of the woody vegetation that might be trying to encroach on the grassland habitat, there's also depositing a lot of poop, which is a lot of nutrients. Um, so the combination of the scattered nutrient input, um, as well as the disturbance through fire and grazing, created a mosaic of habitat for many different species. So you've got some areas that had more nutrients than others, some areas that were um, grazed shorter than others, and this creates a patchwork habitat that is actually excellent um, for a variety of grassland species. Now we know with European settlement in North America, the landscape vastly changed. Um, we had larger cities and towns, um, and uh, yeah, lots of land use changes. So grasslands at risk. So what are some threats to grasslands? We've got the suppression of fire cycles. Um, it makes a lot of sense that as people uh, built infrastructure and homes and, and businesses, um, you don't want uh, grass fires burning that down. So it makes sense that we've suppressed fire cycles, but that also um, doesn't allow the prairie landscape to renew itself. And um, the fires also get rid of um, thatch buildup and, uh, yeah, so, so that's a threat to grasslands. We've also got the removal of bison and other large herbivores from the landscape. Um, so we no longer have um, large numbers, big herds of free roaming bison, um, which have um, co-evolved with the prairies. We also have creation of linear disturbances. So these are things like roads, large transmission lines, uh, train tracks, fences, et cetera, that break up the prairie landscape. And having continuous prairie is very important for some species. We also have the conversion of grassland to other land use types. Um, so in this picture here, this was taken last year. So this is prairie that has been broken up, um, probably in preparation for uh, cropland. But we also have prairie that was um, disturbed or removed as towns and cities grew, um, as subdivisions are built, etc. The majority of remaining prairie in Manitoba occurs on private land. Um, there is not a whole lot of it left, which we'll get into um, in the next slide or two, but what is left is generally on private lands. And a lot of it is actually on lands that are used in cattle production. 
Um, and as a result, cattle producers are extremely important stewards of grassland habitat. As I said, grasslands actually evolved with um, a large herbivore, a large grazer on the landscape. Um, and they need that in order to keep, for example, um, aspen suckers from growing. Um, there's a variety of shrubs like buffalo berry um, that can uh, take over a, a prairie landscape if left unchecked that cattle are really great at, uh, at keeping in check. Um, so responsible grazing can help create and keep that mosaic of habitat that is important for breeding grassland birds and replicating how bison and other grazing animals interacted with grasslands in the past. So in North America, we have uh, three types of prairie, um, which you can see here on the map. This map shows the historical extent of the prairie, not um, necessarily how it looks today. Uh, so tall grass prairie is in that greenish yellow color. Um, and you can see that does come into Manitoba. And tall grass prairie habitat is characterized by having high annual rainfall and cooler temperatures. And you can see it actually takes up quite a good portion of southern Manitoba in this picture. However, what is there, less than 1% of that remains in Manitoba today. Um, in the green color, those, that is the short grass prairie. There we have low annual rainfall and warm temperatures. And this, um, obviously the, the grass is shorter in this uh, prairie habitat, hence its name. And it occurs in mid to south central United States and into Mexico. And we do not have any short grass prairie in Manitoba or in Canada. And the other type of prairie we do have in Manitoba is the intermediate stage between the tall and short grass prairies. And that is the mixed grass prairie. So as you can probably guess, it's got a medium uh, annual rainfall and moderate temperatures. And once again, that grayish color there is its historic extent. So less than 10% of that remains in Manitoba today. So we really have lost a lot of this habitat and this loss is still ongoing as well for both types. So we'll be talking um, about both types of prairie today. Part of the presentation will focus on um, the mixed grass prairie and part of it will talk about both prairie types. So tall grass prairie, as you could see from that map on the last page, occurs primarily in a small area in south central or southeastern Manitoba. Um, while it is important habitat for many breeding birds, bird life is less abundant in the tall grass prairie compared to the mixed grass prairie. Um, however, it is still key breeding bird habitat and um, supports a variety of other plant and animal life. And mixed grass prairie occurs in south central and southwestern Manitoba. And part of what makes the mixed grass prairies such key habitat for a variety of breeding birds is the differences in the areas with short and tall grass that creates a matrix of habitat that allows a large number of different bird species um, to survive here, including species that are found only in this habitat. So during the presentation today, I will be talking about um, species at risk. So I just wanted to give a brief definition about that and what we mean when we say that. Um, so if you look at the graph uh, in the bottom corner, this is from the State of Canada's Birds Report from 2019. And they go through birds found in a variety of different habitats. And this is their graph for grassland birds. So on the vertical axis, you can see the average percent change since 1970. And then we've got year going across the horizontal axis. And you can see that all types of grassland birds have declined um, quite steeply since 1970. Um, in fact, we've lost 300 million grassland birds since then, or two out of every three birds. Um, and this uh, decline is particularly steep for the species dependent on native grasslands. And we know that from the previous slides that we have lost a large extent of our grasslands. So there are two pieces of legislation about species at risk. One is um, federal and one is provincial. The Species at Risk Act is federal and the Endangered Species and Ecosystem Act is provincial. And um, these acts, classify birds, or not just birds, but all organisms, we're talking about birds today, into different categories. So the first category 
would obviously be this species is not at risk. Um, and then stepping up, we've got uh, the category of special con concern, and this is only in the federal act. And then as birds become more at risk, they become threatened and then endangered and then extirpated. So extirpated is a um, organism that is not extinct, it's not totally gone, but it is gone from a specific area. And um, quite a number of our grassland birds we will talk about today will be classified under um, one of these categories. So I thought I would give us a, just a little bit of uh, an orientation as to some of the areas that we're talking about. Um, so on the uh, right side of the screen, we've got um, an area that would be the historic, part of the historic extent of uh, the tall grass prairie habitat. Um, so there still are remains of the tall grass prairie um, in areas down in the bottom right where you've got Vita, uh, Tolstoy, uh, Gardenton, um, etc. That's down in the tall grass prairie preserve. And we also had tall grass prairie and we still have remnants of it all the way up at Okamak. Um, and then on the left side of the screen, we've got some of the historic and also pieces of the current extent of the mixed grass prairie. Um, this is right in the uh, southwestern corner where you can see the white line is uh, the border with Saskatchewan. And don't know if you can just see the border with the United States, but anyways, it's down there right at the bottom or right in the corner. Yeah, so we'll get started a bit on our uh, species identification of grassland birds. Um, and our first category we will be looking at are the primary prairie endemic species. So an endemic species is a plant or animal that is native to and restricted to a specific place or habitat. Um, so I think a lot of people, um, something that would come to mind would be say the giant pandas that live in um, the bamboo forests in specific parts of China. Um, as an example, we also have the power shake skipperling, which is um, down on the flower there in the corner and that only lives in very specific spots in Manitoba. So they, they need a very specific habitat. And then the second part of that title is the primary prairie species. And this is a species that spends the majority or all of its life cycle in the grassland habitat. So for birds, this would be a bird that um, breeds in grassland habitat, uses grassland habitat on migration and also overwinters in grassland habitat. So there are a variety of plants and animals that are endemic to prairie habitat. And um, we have bird species endemic to the mixed grass prairie, but none endemic to the tall grass prairie. So our first bird we will talk about is this um, guy here. This is the Sprague's pipit. Um, Sprague's pipits look quite sparrow-like. Um, they are not sparrows. Um, but they definitely have that same color pattern. Um, if you're taking a quick look and you think, oh, this looks kind of like a sparrow, um, they actually have a longer, narrower beak, which will be part of the giveaway. Also the behavior, but we'll get to that in a second. So they have a pale face with a large eye, a streaked back and a necklace of streaking on the breast. They also have extensive no, white sides on the tail while in flight. Um, and Part of the behavior while I say, why I say that you probably won't get them mixed up with sparrows is that Sprague's pipits are almost always heard before they're seen. Um, the males spend a lot of time up in the air, sort of hovering and gliding and singing um, their territorial song. Um, so you very rarely will see them on the ground. You might accidentally flush them up if you're walking through a prairie, but generally they're gonna be up in the sky. Um, so hopefully this sound will come through, but because their sound to me is so ubiquitous to the prairie and because you often hear them before seeing them, I thought I would try to play part of their song. We'll see if this works. Oh, 
hopefully you guys could hear that. Um, it's a descending whistle, a very nice, clear sounding whistle that starts high and slowly goes uh, slower and slower down in the notes. And uh, the Sprague's pipits is one of those species at risk. Um, in Manitoba, they are classified as threatened. Um, and in Canada, they're also classified as threatened. Um, oh, and our sound is going again. <laughs> So in terms of habitat and where to look for Sprague's pipit, Sprague's pipit like open, expansive, mixed grass prairie habitat. Um, they don't do well in small pieces or um, sort of patchwork grassland habitat. They need a bigger area. Um, they, you can see in this map from the breeding, uh, Manitoba Breeding Bird Atlas. This is a species occurrence map. Um, so it shows, or sorry, a probability of observation map. Um, so it goes from almost white to dark green. And that map is um, basically the probability that you have seeing a bird after 20 hours of searching. So it doesn't mean you need to search 20 hours to see the bird, that's just how they standardize it. But the darker green is the, um, the, the areas where you'd be more likely to see them. So we can see it's mainly in that southwestern corner of Manitoba. Um, if they don't have native prairie available, you can find them in tame pasture lands and haylands. Like I said, they're often seen flying overhead, and you can see them in areas around St. Lazar um, and the Poverty Plains area near Melita, as well as the area around Griswold. So next we have the chestnut collared longspur. Um, this is a, another bird that looks quite sparrow-like, um, slightly smaller, th smaller than the Sprague's pipit. The male stands out quite a bit. Um, he has a rufous or reddish nape, a creamy colored uh, throat and neck, and a black belly. Uh, the female is much more cryptic and um, I would say that you see them way less often than the males, um, as they are much more camouflaged and they don't sing to um, defend their territory. So the female has a broad pale eyebrow above the eye, uh, a relatively plain face, um, a mostly unstreaked breast and a white belly, although you can't um, see the white belly very well in this, in this photo. And once again, with the same as many other of our grassland endemic birds, the chestnut colored longspur is threatened in Manitoba and Canada as well. And where to see the chestnut colored longspur? Um, they like well grazed pastures and short, dry grasslands. Um, prior to the 1980s, they could actually be found, be found east to Winnipeg and also into the southern interlake. Um, the loss of grasslands and uh, wet conditions have led to a range contraction. So you can really see here in this probability of observation map how much the range has contracted if you think that they used to go um, over into uh, areas by Winnipeg. Um, important areas to the chestnut colored long spur include the Shiloh Plains near Shiloh. Um, the Lyleton Pearson area, which is right in the southwestern corner of Manitoba. Um, other areas in the southwest, including the Blind Saurus River Valley and the Poverty, Poverty Plains area, as well as the area around St. Lazar. And actually, around St. Lazar, that's um, in the Ellis Archie Spy Hill Pasture uh, community pasture, it has one of the highest concentrations of chestnut colored longspur in Manitoba. So next we have the Baird Sparrow. Um, definitely a streaky appearance all over. Um, you can't see the front of the bird very well in this picture, but they do have a narrow uh, breast band of streaking as well. You can see that they're mostly buffy colored all over, especially on the head and nape. And they have a white, or uh, sorry, a weak eye line that is strongest near uh, their nape, um, the back of their neck. So the Baird Sparrow are endangered in Manitoba and are considered special concern in, um, in Canada. And because these guys are so cryptic, once again, similar to the Sprague's Pipit, um, they are often heard before they are seen. 
Um, this time it's not because they are flying high up in the air and hovering there. Uh, it is just that they are um, able to camouflage uh, really well into the, uh, their habitat. So I'll play their song again here. And uh, I know someone said it was quiet last time. Um, so I've turned up my sound a little bit. Hopefully um, you can hear it better, but I'll be quiet. <laughs> Oh, and it stopped. It's very much uh, a high pitched trilling, trilling sound. So in terms of habitat, um, the Baird Sparrow prefers ungrazed to moderately grazed native prairie with minimal shrub cover or areas of denser vegetation in well grazed areas. So the Baird Sparrow do like areas with taller grass. They can sometimes be found in tame grasslands, so not native grasslands, haylands and some alfalfa fields. The Baird Sparrow are partly nomadic, so during the extended drought cycles, such as the late 1980s, it actually expanded in both abundance and range in Manitoba as far east as Winnipeg. Um, so we'll hear this a couple times where in dry periods of drought, um, the grassland birds have expanded. Um, and while we don't know if we're going into a, a drought cycle, this has been a dry year, so we may actually see grassland birds in um, some areas that were previously marginal or not great habitat. As the land dries out, um, they may be able to, to nest in some areas where we wouldn't normally see them. As you can see from the occurrence map, um, they're generally seen right in the southwest corner of Manitoba, um, down even more southwest than Melita. Um, and the map doesn't show this, but they can also be seen up near um, St. Lazar, near Russell um, as well. Okay, and now we have our endemic birds of prey. Um, so this species is the Ferruginous hawk. They are a large hawk, um, Manitoba's biggest hawk at 1.6 kilograms. They have a large bill. And since we often see um, hawks from underneath rather than on top or beside, um, they sort of identifying them from underneath. The main characteristic is um, a mostly white chest, some rufous or reddish markings on the wings, but the main one is the rufous or reddish, reddish V made by the legs. Um, so Manitoba only has three species of birds of prey that have feathered legs and the Ferguson's hawk is one of them. And uh, you can see in the picture on the far left, um, the darkly feathered legs. And if you were able to see both sides, that would form a V. So Ferguson's hawks are endangered in Manitoba. Their populations got very, very low at one point. Um, there have been um, artificial nesting structures installed to, to help bring populations back up. Um, and uh, you can see them on the prairies. They just take some, uh, some looking to find and they are threatened in Canada. So here is their um, probability of observation map. You can see once again, we're in the mixed grass prairie right in the southwestern corner. Um, they do have a bit of a, of a, um, a wider area where you're more likely to see them. They like expansive, undisturbed grasslands. Similar to this Rags Pipit, they need space. Um, like I said, there have been artificial nests installed and their natural nesting spot would be isolated trees. Um, so if you picture in your head a vast unbroken prairie and then um, every once in a while a tree prop pops out of the landscape, that would be a great nesting tree for the Fringinus hawk. Their main prey species are ground squirrels. So you'll often find them um, near ground squirrel colonies. And like I said, they're right in the southwest corner of Manitoba, um, north to Pipestone and east to Boise of Vane. So the last of the primary prairie species um, we'll talk about is the burrowing owl. Um, so we have the juvenile on the left and the adult burrowing owl on the right. 
Um, they are quite a small owl. They have um, a white throat. They have white eyebrows as well as the juvenile has a bit more of a white mask. Um, they have broad barring on the underside and they have long legs and burrowing owls are endangered in both Manitoba, uh, both provincially and federally. Um, burrowing owls prefer well-drained areas with short or sparse vegetation, such as moderately or heavy gra heavily grazed prairie. They require the abandoned burrows of other animals. So burrowing owls do not dig their own burrows. Um, they use burrows that are left over from other animals like ground squirrels. Um, while they like to live in areas with sparse vegetation, they often forage in nearby areas with taller vegetation. So they really need um, that matrix of different uh, habitat types and different grass heights. Uh, their former Manitoba range went all the way east to the Red River Valley and north to Dauphin, um, but like many of these grassland species, a lot of that habitat has been lost and now they are um, found in the southwest corner of Manitoba. Um, and this happened around the 1980s. Um, if you're in that area, you may see these enclosures that I have a picture of on the top. So Manitoba has um, uh, another group called the Manitoba Brewing Owl Recovery Program, and they actually do um, captive uh, release of uh, burrowing owls. And uh, so if you'd like to learn more about burrowing owls or um, how they're helping the population recover, I encourage you to go check out either their website or their Facebook page. Um, they've also got lots of cute pictures that they post throughout the season. And they do things also like um, installing artificial burrows, um, which the burrowing owls will also use. So that's the end of our primary prairie endemic species. And we'll move on to the second secondary prairie species as well. So in terms of secondary prairie species, these are birds that spend only a proportion of their life cycle in grasslands or um, in their species range, only a small part of it is in grasslands. So they don't depend on the grasslands in the same way that the um, primary prairie species do. Um, and as a result, you'll see as I go through, a lot fewer of these species are species at risk, and that is because they can adapt their, their life cycle or their habitat ranges to a wider variety of habitats. As well, um, a lot of these secondary prairie species can be found both in the area that was historically tall grass prairie, as well as the area that was historically mixed grass prairie. So one of these birds is the loggerhead shrike. Um, so it may not be super apparent when you first take a look, but there are actually two um, different birds on the screen here. The one on the left is the loggerhead shrike, and the one on the right is the uh, northern shrike. Um, so if I change my little spotlight here. Um, so the loggerhead shrike, to tell the difference, has a broader dark mask. Um, you can see that it goes, the mask goes on top of the eye as well as on the bottom of the eye, so it covers the eye area entirely. Whereas the northern shrike, you can see that you have the black mask and then there's a bump where the eye is, the eye goes on top of the mask and then back around. Um, as well, the loggerhead shrike has a stubbier bill with a less defined hook and it is um, a darker color on the back. But to me, the mask is, uh, is uh, one of the more obvious features, especially since color can get distorted by what kind of light you're seeing the bird in. Um, so yeah, so the loggerhead shrike is our secondary prairie species. The northern shrike is found in other habitats usually. Um, and uh, the loggerhead shrike is um, a species at risk. In terms of habitat where you can see loggerhead shrike, um, this is a species despite being uh, a secondary prairie species, uh, we in Manitoba at least, we find it primarily in the southwestern um, area of the province. They like open habitat characterized by low grasses mixed with bare ground and shrubs or trees. And they like to nest in scattered trees or shrubs within pasture lands, farm shelter belts, roadsides, cemeteries, etc., where you have open mowed areas with some widely scattered shrubs and trees. Um, 
They do like to be nearby barbed fence or thorny vegetation. Um, a nickname for both shrike species is the butcher bird. Um, they do catch and eat uh, small uh, small creatures and uh, they use the barbs of the fence or the thorns of the vegetation um, to impale and hold their prey. Um, despite being a passerine or a songbird, um, they do have that hooked bill that is characteristic of many birds of prey um, that helps them uh, take apart their prey when they're ready to eat them. So next we have a couple of prairie species. Uh, so first we have the grasshopper sparrow. Uh, grasshopper sparrow is 17 grams, uh, a buffy brown overall. The back is patterned with rufous black and gray. Um, they have a complete white eye ring and a large bill. Once again, um, like the Baird sparrow, grasshopper sparrow is very cryptically patterned. Um, this is another one where it's very useful to be able to hear it before seeing it. So that was just its song there. I'll play it one more time because it only went once in the recording. But you'll hear the grasshopper sparrow and then you will also hear a Sprague's pipit in the background. Very quiet. So in terms of habitat, you'll find grasshopper sparrows in areas of large, dense, idle fields and hay fields, as well as in denser vegetation um, clusters in moderately grazed um, pasture lands. They also generally prefer open grasslands. This is another species that had a temporary increase in distribution and abundance in Manitoba during a period of major drought um, in the late 1980s. Um, so we may see them uh, expand their abundance and distribution again this year if it stays dry. Their core range is in southwestern Manitoba, but it extends sort of in a wedge shape um, out to Brandon and the Assiniboine River. Oh, and just going back to loggerhead shrike, uh, Joe posted in the chat that uh, loggerheads had a population south of Okamak Marsh along Blackdale Road until about 10 to 15 years ago, gone now. Um, so our next sparrow we're looking at here is the Savannah Sparrow. Um, and these guys uh, are found in a much wider variety of habitats, um, which I'll get to in the next slide. So they are basically streaky all over. They have a boldly streaked back. They also have fine streaks on the breast, um, but under the breast, they do actually have a white belly. So that part is unstreaked. They have a strong, complete eye ring, and they also usually have yellow lores. And the lore is the area of feathers um, between the eye and the um, beak. So you can, you can see the yellow lores quite well in this picture. So here is their probability of observation map. And you can see it looks quite different than a lot of the species we've looked at so far. Um, you can see that they're much more widespread um, and population abundance is higher and they're much easier to detect in areas that were both previously tall grass prairie and also areas that are previously mixed grass prairie. So very wide range. You can find them in a range of settings. They're common in hay fields, lightly grazed pastures and prairie vestiges. So what's left of the prairies. Um, they can also be found in areas of monoculture cropland. Um, yeah, so they are, are, are much more common across the landscape. Next, we have a very charismatic bird. This is the bobolink. Um, they stand out quite a bit. You'll generally see the males um, standing out. They are, he is, the, I guess, the black one in this picture. So they have a black head and um, breast and belly, a black underside, a cream colored nape, um, and they are white on the back, which you can't see here, but I'll show you another picture with that. The female is much more cryptically colored. Um, she's got a pale nape, pale lures, the area between the eye and the bill, and a large pinkish bill, and both have a short pointed tail. 
Uh, the Bobo link is uh, classified as threatened federally. So the males will often sit up high and sing, and I don't have a, um, a recording of their song, but if you can picture in your head or listen in your head to what R2-D2 sounds like, that is what the male Bobo link sounds like. Um, so here's a picture of him sitting on the barbed wire fence. You can see his white back here too. Bobolink nest on the ground and they use a large variety of grassland habitats, including native pastures, um, native, uh, hay fields, white metal, wet meadows, and anywhere where herbaceous vegetation is relatively tall. And like I said, males will often perch up high um, to sing. And uh, you can see in the um, the occurrence map here that you can find them across southern Manitoba into the interlake um, areas. And uh, contrary to a lot of our um, grassland birds, particularly the, the primary prairie endemic species, bobo lynx actually tend to like uh, wetter habitats as opposed to the drier habitats that are favored by a lot of uh, grassland birds. So we have a, another very charismatic um, bird up next, the Western Meadowlark. Um, they have quite, quite large, 97 grams. Uh, they're very round bodied with a short tail and they have a very flat head and a long slender bill and silhouette. Um, so if you can see this guy sitting on the barbed wire fence, the head just barely makes it above where the bill is. Um, so very, uh, very flat headed species in silhouette. Of course, um, if you see them not in silhouette, they've got a bright yellow neck and breast with a black necklace. Um, and when in flight, their tail has white outer feathers. So their presence on the landscape in terms of their um, probability of observation generally follows areas um, of grassland and farmland. They prefer native prairie, um, lightly grazed pasture and hayland over monoculture cropland. But even in areas with cropland, you can find them along roadsides on the ground or singing on fence posts. So the meadowlark singing in the, the photo on the bottom right here, that's a pretty um, common um, meadowlark posture or behavior. Our next species is the horned lark, um, quite a bit smaller than the meadow lark. They have a very characteristic black mustache. You can see the feathers coming down um, off the uh, beak there. Their body is a pale rusty or sandy brown colored and they are darker on the back than on the underside. And when in flight, they have a dark tail with pale middle feathers and narrow white edges. Um, and you can see in this photo here, this is the horned lark, but you don't see any horns and they can put the, the feathers that are the horns up and down. Um, so this next picture has uh, a horned lark um, with the feathers up. So horned like larks like areas with um, bare or sparsely vegetated ground. Um, this ground can be heavily grazed. It could be bare because it's cultivated or it could be naturally sparse. And next we will get into um, a couple of birds that um, depend on um, eating insects in prairie habitats. So our first one is the Eastern Bluebird. They are a beautiful bird with an orange breast and sides of the neck and a white belly. And they're also um, blue above. So that's from the head, on the wings, on the back and on the tail. And the females, follow a very similar color pattern, but are drabber overall. So the blue is just not as bright, the orange is just not as bright, um, et cetera. So um, naturally, Eastern bluebirds were found in areas of open woodlands. They are cavity nesters and they do not make their own cavities. So they would um, originally use cavities that were say hollowed out and then abandoned by woodpeckers. Um, However, now you can also find them in agricultural areas. Um, 
many people will put up nest boxes for them, wooden nest boxes along fence posts. Um, so you can you can find them in some areas where you wouldn't think that there would necessarily be eastern bluebird habitat. They do like to have fences or other high areas uh, which they can sit and look for insects and then they'll sally out, go out and catch an insect and uh, bring it back and sit and eat it and then repeat. Um, yeah, and like I said, they benefit from nest boxes along fence posts. Next, we have the Eastern Kingbird. So the Eastern Kingbird is another bird um, that eats insects. They have a dark back and head, a uh, white throat, breast and belly. So they're dark all along the back and uh, white all along the underside. They also have a black tail with a white tip that runs along the edge. And this white tip can be seen here, like when they're at rest, and it can also be seen um, while they're flying about. And we do have two species of kingbirds in Manitoba, the Eastern Kingbird and the Western Kingbird. And I used to get their names mixed up all the time. And the way I remember them is Eastern Kingbirds are foggy and gray, um, like the Maritimes. And uh, we'll see the, the memory um, system for the Western Kingbirds in a second. So in terms of Eastern Kingbird's habitat, you can see them in areas um, of grasslands across Southern Manitoba, in areas that were tall grass prairie, in areas that were um, mixed grass prairie. Um, they do, in addition to grasslands, they do like areas near water or wetlands. And this is often found along the edges of pastures or native grasslands. Um, we've conveniently put in ditches along a lot of roads. Um, so they can have the best of both worlds. They can have the pasture um, as well as wet areas. And um, a lot of birds that eat insects um, can be found along areas of water um, because a lot of insects have a aquatic uh, larval stage. So often insect populations are higher near water. And so you find the, um, the birds that eat the insects. Um, similar to the eastern bluebird, the eastern kingbird likes to sit on wires, poles, or tall trees and sally out for insects. So go out and catch them and bring them back and eat them. So next we have the western kingbird, about the same size as the eastern kingbird. They have a thick bill and a long tail. Um, you can see the color is quite distant, uh, dis different. So while the Eastern Kingbird was foggy and gray like the Maritimes, the Western Kingbird to me is golden like Western wheat. Um, and that golden area is the buffy yellow uh, on the body. They also have a pale gray head and a dark back and wings. Um, their tail is black, but instead of having a white tip, they have white edges. So in terms of um, probability of observation and sort of species occurrence, the Western Kingbird you can see here has a stronger affiliation with the mixed grass prairie than the Eastern Kingbird. Although you can find it in areas that were and are both mixed grass prairie and tall grass prairie, you can see the two sort of distinct areas on the map there. Shelter belts and abandoned farmyards can be good places to look for this species. Um, as they do eat insects, they can be associated with water and wetlands, um, looking for that, those higher concentrations of prey. And similar to our other uh, insectivorous birds we've talked about so far, they also sit up high on wires, posts, or trees, um, and sally out for insects. Um, and now we'll get into just a couple species that I chose as representatives of birds who um, are grassland associated birds, but also like, um, uh, I guess, wetter areas. So the first of those would be the short-eared owl. Um, it's a medium-sized owl, a round head with a white face and dark eye patches, and the body is heavily streaked. It has barred wingtips when in flight, and it is a species at risk, both federally and provincially. Um, you can see that from the probability of observation map, there's no real sort of high concentration of short-eared owls. Um, near Winnipeg, I know that Okamic Marsh can be good to see them occasionally. 
Um, they use grasslands, but also wetter, wetter areas like open bogs, fens, or marshes. And they can also nest in agricultural fields, um, although this is increasingly rare due to the way we farm. Um, they like to be in areas of dense grass or shrub cover, but they like their nesting areas to be slightly raised and dry. And the short-eared owl hunts during the day. Next, you may remember if you were in the um, sh uh, shorebirds webinar, we'll do a, a brief overview of these guys. I'll go fast because we've talked about them in a past webinar. But the upland sandpiper is a shorebird that is not really associated with water. It is a grassland nesting uh, sandpiper. They look kind of comical. They have a small head with a large eye and a very skinny neck, a short yellowish bill, yellow legs, a long tail, and they make a very loud wolf whistle call. Um, you can find them in both um, the mixed grass and the tall grass prairie area. Um, they breed in prairie and tame pastures in areas with both tall and short grasses. Um, they can persist in agricultural areas with low numbers if there are grassy road margins for them to use. Um, and you can see they're concentrated um, west of the Glenboro area um, in the mixed grass prairie. And you can also often see them standing uh, on roadsides and on fence posts. Oh, we've got from James Patterson, short-eared owls are special concerned under the Species at Risk Act, so this is federal under Canada's Act, um, but were just reevaluated as threatened by COSEWIC. So um, COSEWIC is the committee that um, uh, advises, I guess, how um, the Species at Risk Act should classify um, species. So we may see that one then um, be bumped up under the Species at Risk Act soon if, if COSEWIC has... Um, has recommended that they be a threatened, a classified as a threatened species. Thank you, James. And so last but not least, we have the marbled godwit, another shorebird species. Um, you will find them in association with wetlands and water. Um, however, they do often nest in grassland areas. Um, so they are a larger shorebird than the upland sandpiper at 370 grams. You can identify them by their long upturned bill that has a pinkish base and a dark colored tip. They also have black legs and when they raise their wings to go fly, the underside of their wing feathers is uh, cinnamon colored. And then overall they are a buffy cinnamon color. Um, you can find marble godwits uh, across southern Manitoba. Um, you can see them in the southwest. You can see them in the southern interlake, um, as well as in the southeast. They nest in native grasslands and human altered landscapes, such as sewage lagoons, haylands, even some croplands. Um, and like I mentioned, you can see them by water, but they can also be found a considerable distance from water. So that is it for um, us going through species. There are some species here that you find in grasslands that I did not have time to mention today, particularly those secondary um, prairie species. Um, so this is not a definitive guide, but hopefully that gave you a bit of an overview for when you're next um, birding in a tall or short grass prairie. Um, so yeah, I'll go through a couple of spots here that have uh, are, have places to bird in tall grass prairie as well as in short grass prairie. Um, so in terms of tall grass prairie, in the city of Winnipeg, we have the Living Prairie Museum, which is sits on a parcel of tall grass prairie that was set aside in 1968. Um, and you can find the Living Prairie Museum in the neighborhood of St. James. It has a short walking trail that you can do, and you can see secondary prairie species such as savanna sparrows, clay-colored sparrows, western meadowlark, and bobolink. And another piece of remnant tall grass prairie is um, on the western side of Okamic Marsh. Um, you can see all the marsh cells there in a darker color, and on the western side there's a lighter color, um, Brennan Prairie, um, the tall grass prairie area. Um, here you can find things such as the western meadowlark, sharp-tailed grouse, horned lark, Savanna Sparrow, Upland Sandpiper, Marbled Godwit, and I mentioned it can be a good spot to check out for short-eared owls. And for tall grass prairie, last but not least, Nature Conservancy Canada, or NCC, um, owns some um, parcels of tall grass prairie right 
um, along the border with the United States. Um, I have them outlined in green here by Tolstoy, Stuart Byrne, sort of Gardenton, that area. Um, and you can find more information about this um, on their website or if you Google the uh, Manitoba Tall Grass Prairie Preserve. And there, each of these spots has a walking trail um, that you can go on to look for birds. And you can see things here like eastern kingbirds, upland sandpipers, savanna sparrows, clay-colored sparrows, western meadowlark, sharp-tailed grouse, and bobolink. And in terms of mixed grass prairies, now we've moved into southwestern Manitoba. And um, you had asked about Ellis Archie Spy Hill Community Pasture. I think that was Phil who had asked earlier. Um, so this is an active community pasture. There are uh, cattle on the landscape. So permission from the pasture manager is required. Um, if you'd like to get that contact information, um, you can send me an email, the same uh, email that you um, contacted me to register for the webinar. Um, I'm not sure what's going on with COVID still with them. Um, so, so yeah, we'd have to check in with them. Um, Nature Conservancy Canada also owns a parcel of land right near um, St. Lazar um, that has trails of varying lengths. Um, once again, that is actively managed with cattle, um, so you do need to contact the NCC Manitoba office for permission. And if you'd like to just go birding and not worry about getting permission to access these areas, um, Highway 41 does run through the southern portion of Ellis Archie, um, where you can bird from. Uh, it can be quite a busy highway, so just bird with care. Um, but Ellis Archie um, is uh, one of our biggest last remaining areas of mixed grass prairie, so it really is important for a lot of bird species. And hence why my list is here is quite long and includes basically all of our prairie endemic species, chestnut colored longspurs, rags pipits, um, baird sparrows, grasshopper sparrows, mountain bluebirds, bobolinks, short-eared owls, and many more. Um, the next area I would suggest if you want to see um, especially the prairie endemic species is the southwestern mixed grass prairie important bird area. Um, so the important bird area, uh, you might recognize the name from our program. Um, it's not protected, it's more of an outreach tool and a recognition that this area is important for birds, whether they be migra migratory birds or breeding birds. Um, so this area is primarily good for car birding just because of the vast extent of it if you want to cover a good portion there are a lot of mile roads that go past native pastures um, there is the Ralph Wang Trail also on NCC land which is open to the public you don't need permission to go on that one um, can be a good place to get out and stretch your legs um, if you've done a whole lot of car birding um, and also for just suggestions on where to bird um, there is the Manitoba Grasslands Birding Trail Guide, which has a um, northern route and a southern route um, that you can take a look at. And the, uh, each of the stops here, the numbered stops, has a little uh, billboard or placard um, that explains some of the species you can see in the area and about the habitat. Um, so that can be uh, a nice way to sort of plan your plan your car adventures in the southwest. And so here is just a short list of the birds that some of the birds that you can see in the southwestern mixed grass prairie IBA. You can see that we've got our endemic species, the Ferminus hawk, chestnut colored longspur, sprags pipit, burrowing owl, and baird sparrow, as well as the grasshopper sparrow, loggerhead shrike, upland sandpiper, marbled godwit, and another species that you don't see out of this area too often, the Sace Phoebe, that we didn't have time to cover. And my last area I'll suggest to you is the Oak Lake Plum Lakes IBA. Um, this, despite being named for, for two lakes, um, the, this area does have remnant native grassland and tame grassland, especially on the western side um, in the areas around Bellevue and Pipestone. Um, this area does get more grassland species in dry years, so it could be an interesting spot to check out this year if it stays dry. 
And because of the lakes and marshy areas, it can also be good for um, grassland birds that are associated with wetlands and the prairie pothole region. And here are some species that you can see here, sprags, pipits, chestnut colored long spurs, baird sparrow, grasshopper sparrow, loggerhead shrike, burrowing owl, frogginus hawk, and you can get quite big concentrations of sandhill cranes. So the last bit is when to bird. In terms of time of year, it's best to go out during the breeding bird season. This is when a lot of the birds, especially usually the males, are vocal and displaying and easiest to see in here. And in terms of time of day, a lot of these birds are most active in the morning, starting about half hour before dawn to around 10.30 a.m. They do try to um, hunker down in the heat of the day. So if you go in late May, for example, they'll be, um, they won't be as active as early and they'll be active later into the day. Whereas if you go in July and it's a really hot day, they're probably up early and they will start hunkering down earlier um, in the morning as well. So yeah, that is all that I have for you today. Hopefully we have given you some um, new target species to see this summer and or some um, new and interesting places to bird. Um, but yeah, overall, thank you for spending your Tuesday evening with us.